let me say, let me tell you, begin with an uh, anecdote about the election and where I was and you know, what was said to me. So I was in North Carolina on November 8th. The New Yorker dispatched me there to write about uh, voter suppression. And I was there with uh, Reverend William Barber, who some of you know from the NAACP in North Carolina. And we'd gone around to uh, some of the outlying areas in eastern North Carolina, and some of the impoverished communities there. And we were looking at the difficulty in accessing the ballot and whether or not people were going to be able to vote and you know, what some of the impediments were and so on. And we got back to Durham uh, around the time of the closing of the polls. And like many people, you know, I watched the returns with a growing sense of dread about what was happening um, in the country and what we were witnessing, what was uh, transpiring. And so I stayed up most of the night. I slept very little. And the following morning, I got to the airport for a flight back to New York. Um, I boarded the plane and sat down. And behind me, there were two women, I noticed there were two women who were in the midst of a conversation. And at some point, I noticed that uh, one of the women seemed to be crying, they're kind of sitting behind me. And then I, it sounds like two people are crying, I turn around. And in short order, both of these women are sobbing. Um, and these are two white women who are maybe in their 40s. And I wondered if this had something to do with the election. And so after a moment, I just kind of struck up a conversation that kind of had composed themselves and I, and I asked if, if it in fact had to do with the election. And they said something I found striking, that in the course of just talking with each other, they realized that they both had uh, relatives, close relatives, with uh, developmental disabilities. And they were horrified, they were crying at the thought of the type of cruelty that had been validated and what they thought their relatives might have to experience over the course of the next four years. And this recognition, I think it was one woman's son and the other woman's brother, maybe, uh, but close family relatives. And they were both, when they realized they had this connection, they both began crying because they thought that a particular kind of cruelty, given what we had seen during the campaign and the ridiculing of a reporter um, who had a physical disability, that they thought that this kind of cruelty had been validated now in the highest office in the land. And one of the women said, and I told them, you know, that I was a writer and I was there, had been covering uh, the statewide races in North Carolina. And one of the women said, well, well, what happened? How did this happen? And I said, I'm not sure that any of us know. And the woman next to her said, oh, I can tell you how this happened. Uh, this happened because of a crisis in education. And she said, I'm a teacher and we have been ignoring education for 40 years. And when you ignore education the way that we have, you produce an electorate that is capable of being misled in the way that this one has. And that stayed with me because if we are to ever confront where we are and how we got here, we will have to confront the failure to educate our population and the success in miseducating the population in very many ways. And the context and the way in which none of these things can be kind of neatly parsed from each other.